Director of the National Consumer Voice for Quality Long-Term Care. And thank you for joining us this afternoon for today's webinar, Obtaining Quality Care for Residents with Dementia. We are delighted to have you with us today. Um, we know that some of you um, had joined us about a week ago when we were having some technical difficulties. And so thank you for sticking with us and joining us again um, this afternoon, where we'll do um, a repeat of the full program. Um, we are delighted to have Dr. Jonathan Evans with us, who's going to be our presenter this afternoon. Um, and we'll be talking about obtaining quality care for residents with dementia, what good dementia care looks like, um, assuring residents' needs and preferences are being met in a person-centered way, um, and, um, and have the opportunity to um, get some questions from you. Um, as well and um, have Dr. Evans respond to those. So um, before I turn it over to Dr. Evans, I just want to let you all know that um, you're in listen-only mode right now. Um, we are recording the program and we will be sending the recording to you all um, afterwards. Um, also, we will be um, pausing at, at some points during the conversation to take questions from you. So um, in the chat and question box on the dashboard on your screen, you'll be able to type in some questions and we will be able to pose those to Dr. Evans and have him respond to them for you. So um, Dr. Evans is a nursing home doctor. He um, has been working in this field for a number of years. Um, he is currently on the Consumer Voices Board of Directors and is a former past president of AMDA, the Society for Post-Acute and Long-Term Care Medicine. And um, while I turn it over to Dr. Evans, I'm going to um, pull up his slides and, and we'll get going. So Jonathan, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Lori, and thank you to each of you and all of you who are on the call. I, uh, I apologize sincerely for uh, last time if you were, if you're, if you're calling back in. I had, I was in a nursing home that was in the middle of their survey and I it was on my cell phone and but anyway, I'm, it was a, I apologize. Uh, but that also gave me a chance to reflect some and I'm hoping that I can communicate certain things better. I had some things that I wanted to talk about that we didn't, so I've modified the slides somewhat as well. Um, God bless you if you if you're if you've called in twice. Uh, you're you're uh, long suffering. Uh, I want to ask you a question to think about. Uh, this is the most critical question of all for today. Uh, I want, uh, and I really want to answer this for you. But the, the the answer is different for each of you. I want you to think about what exactly is it that you want to know or achieve from participating in this. Uh, in this webinar. You, you chose this topic for a reason. I assume you have a question of your own or a goal in mind. And I want to make sure, and again, especially if you've endured this twice, I want to make sure it's worth your while. So please think about what it is you want to know or do, or, you know, uh, because I, I want to make sure we have ample time to discuss that. And what I'm going to do um, is I'm going to hopefully quickly review uh, the first part of the presentation, which talks a little bit about some of the challenges and problems, and I'm going to spend this time the majority of the time focusing on solutions. Okay, so uh, look, I, I had listed for objectives several things. You know, the, the this topic is the focus is really trying to get quality care for people with dementia. Uh, as I mentioned last time, I prefer, even though as you'll see from some of my slides, I was sloppy. I prefer to think about patients with problems than patients as the problem or as the disease. So I apologize for some of my poor writing here. But I want you to think about uh, what uh, good dementia care looks like or, and, and picture in your own mind what you think the best care might look like, even if you've never seen it in real life. And then I, you know, some of the things that we want to address are you know, in a, in a hopefully fairly systematic way, uh, trying to decide the components of good care and good care for people with dementia, how we can identify that or evaluate that, and also how we can try to make it happen or assure that it's happening. Um, and obviously, I want you to think about 
what you consider to be high quality care and comp compare and contrast that to care that you see in different settings. And we'll talk about how each of us and all of us together can make things better. Okay, so that said, I'm going to uh, have a case here on the next slide that, um, that I mean, many of you, again, if you may have heard about, but basically this, this is a gentleman that was tied to bed, to the bed and in, in a jerry chair when he wasn't in bed with physical restraints. He's been given certain medicines, Ativan and Haldol. Haldol is an antipsychotic drug, Ativan is a benzodiazepine. And these were given as needed for agitation. He was uh, put on a pureed diet as a result of some swallowing problems caused by medications. He eventually got a pressure ulcer then he ended up having a catheter placed in his bladder because his, uh, he was incontinent and he hasn't left this particular room for the last six days except to have an x-ray. Uh, though I, I think it's safe to say that this probably is not anybody's idea on the call of what uh, good dementia care looks like, good care of people with dementia, but I, I'm sorry to report that this is a case, a real case that I just saw a couple of weeks ago uh, and he and that was care that he received in the hospital. Um, that same care in a different setting, like a nursing facility, would be considered unacceptable. And I'm not suggesting that nursing home care is better than hospital care or vice versa. I'm just trying to point out that what's done in different settings is very, very different. Uh, but as you'll see, the, what complicates things is that more and more when people are very sick, the care that they receive is also is often fragmented across multiple settings, and it changes pretty quickly, uh, which causes some other problems. Uh, so, uh, in a nursing facility, it would be considered impermissible to use a vest restraint. Uh, the use of Ativan or Haldol as needed for agitation would be considered um, uh, a deficient practice according to the regulations for nursing homes. And similarly, a bladder catheter would also be considered uh, a, uh, a deficient practice uh, in the absence of uh, an inability to void. Uh, and certainly, we would not be satisfied with somebody being confined to their room for six days. Um, so let's let's take the next slide here, and I'm going to try to go a little faster through some of these things. As, I, as, as I'm sure you all know, dementia is a growing public health concern and has a huge potential impact on everything and everybody. Um, I, I, just to highlight some of these things, um, here, here's the bottom line. I think everybody on this call would agree that the care of many people with dementia, frankly, even though it's different in different settings, across all settings, we could probably all agree that the care of people with dementia, at least sometimes, is not what we would like it to be. We know that things can be better. What I want to point out, though, is that um, the way things are right now is the way that people have been taught for decades. Okay, And so as a consequence, if you're in that environment as a care provider, as a physician or nurse or CNA, and you're doing what other people taught you to do, or what you see done elsewhere, it's hard to comprehend that what you might that what you're doing isn't the right thing. And nobody wants to do the wrong thing, by and large. And so when we tell people they're doing the wrong thing, especially if it's what they've been taught to do and what they see other people do, they have a very hard time accepting that they might that they could do things better or differently. And the result tends to be people being very defensive. Uh, so. Uh, uh, and you know these are problems that could potentially get a whole lot worse as the population ages and as more people have dementia and more people are less able to advocate for themselves. So we'll we'll talk about ways that to sort of deal with that. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so there there are a number of challenges. I alluded to some of these already. I'm going to spend a little more time talking about staffing than I did before. If you listened to me earlier, but um, there are challenges related to the care environment, fragmented care, the culture of health care, education and training, which I alluded to, and issues related to communication. Uh, next slide, please. I'm going to say a little bit more about each of these things. Um, this is I hadn't told you about this uh, gentleman or this situation, but this was a patient of mine. Uh, and this, this woman I took care of for about eight years. 
Uh, in fact, I'm going to have lunch with her son on Friday. He, we, he and I are friends. His, his mother has since passed away at about age 100, and her sister, uh, who was over 100, just passed away recently. But th this, th these are people who he relocated to be closer to him, his mother and his aunt. And this particular case involves his mother. And here's the situation in a nutshell. Uh, we have a woman who's been in excellent health her whole life, but in the last couple of years developed dementia and couldn't care for herself. And he moved her to a continuous care retirement community, and upon arrival, they determined that she needed to be in the nursing facility because of her care needs. Um, he actually, uh, to make a long story short, he actually ended up providing more or less around-the-clock care for his mother in addition to the facility staff. But the important part of this is that I wanted to emphasize is that um, th this guy is really an He's a businessman. He's not a healthcare person, but in his in his career in business, he's become an expert on systems and processes. You know, in terms of inventory and how things move and personnel and so forth. And so, so to make a long story short, when he wasn't traveling, he spent most of his time at his mother's bedside with his phone and his computer and conducting business. And as a result, he, he knew every single person in the nursing home, knew them by name, and called them by name. Uh, take my word for it, he's a wonderful guy and a, a, a beautiful soul who's trying to make the world a better place. And uh, so, like, as you might imagine, I mean, you, you probably, if you're in healthcare, you've probably experienced people who are like this, who are successful, who see a problem, point it out, and demand that it be fixed immediately. But this guy was quite different in that he would see a problem, he would point it out to the patient, and, and, and he would say, now, I've been observing this, and I think uh, this is, these are some of the root causes of your problem, and here are some different solutions that you might consider to solving it. Um, but I would recommend, out of A, B, C, and D, I'd recommend B because of X, Y, and Z. So a very thoughtful guy who's basically providing them literally thousands of dollars of free consulting advice. And what kind of reaction do you think he got from the facility? I know you can't answer me out loud, but I just want you to think about it. In almost every instance, he would be told, oh, no, it's not a problem at all, OK? Uh, and he, and he'd say, they'd say, it's not a problem at all because we've always done it that way, and every other place does it that way. So I'm, try I'm trying to point out to you, first of all, this culture, which is a culture of sameness and conformity. And healthcare professions are the only, only careers I know of where the assumption is that the day you finish school, you know everything you need to know. Most other fields, the assumption is that's just the beginning and, you sh you know, and, and your education will be obsolete at some point. So, and I, I, he, he was very frustrated about this. I, I'll try not to belabor this. But he couldn't understand why people were so unwilling to consider that things could be better or different. And finally, I, I, I just, I, I, after ruminating about this myself, I said to him, you see what's possible, and it makes what is unacceptable. All they see is what is, and it makes what's possible impossible. Okay? So I, I, I would say a challenge for all of us is to try to see what's possible and make it happen. But I just want you to understand that there are there are real cultural barriers, uh, and that's that's an under that make change often quite difficult. Um, he ended up being the on the family council which they started, and he did make a big difference there. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, I, I, as far as the care environment is concerned, I just want to point out that if you look at the physical spaces of a hospital, a nursing home, or even assisted living facility. That most of the square footage of, uh, you know, a, a lot, a lot of the focus is really on a bedroom, okay, and so, uh, uh, with, and one of the negative consequences of that is people often spend too much time in bed, which isn't very healthy. The other thing is that in all of these places that are shared with other people, there are certain places that are essentially considered off limits, and that's very different from what you would experience in your own home, uh, and if you have Alzheimer's, it would be impossible, just by the nature of your condition, it would be impossible for you to comprehend that certain parts of your environment are off limits, okay? 
so that can you could see how that could result in a conflict between the individual and the environment. Um, also, certain things like sharing a room with somebody that's not your family member, that's not most that's not what most people experience now. So you could imagine that would be quite an adjustment. And the adjustment would be based on your ability to comprehend that and accept that, whereas people living with dementia might mistake that person as an intruder, and that could be conflict. Okay, So you can see I'm, what I'm trying to do is set the stage for how certain kinds of behaviors might occur that might be considered unacceptable in a, in a restrictive environment, but that are actually quite natural and normal if you put yourself in the position of that person and what they're perceiving or misperceiving about the environment. Next slide, please. Okay. Um, and again, I'm, I'm going to try to speed up a little bit here. So, but, but here's a woman who was uh, living in an assisted living or facility or nursing home, and she was wandering to other people's rooms, was found sleeping in somebody else's bed, and was wearing somebody else's sweater. So I just want to ask you to think about, as a, if you're a caregiver, how uh, in a uh, if you're a paid caregiver how you would how that would behavior would be treated in your facility uh, if you're a, a family member how would you feel if you walked into your mother's room and found this other woman in her bed instead or if you if this was your mother and you found that she was in a different room and the reason I say that is because how this is approached varies tremendously based upon people's perception about what's acceptable, what's normal or not. But I might ask you, how many of you have ever wandered into the wrong, if you work in a healthcare facility, how many of you have ever gone into the wrong room? I've done it a million times, and I dare say it's easy to do because by and large they all kind of look alike. Um, I've even been in hotels in a, uh, many, many times where I've gone, I've tried to use the wrong, the key in the wrong door. Uh, much to my embarrassment, and uh, once in a great while the door actually opened, which is even worse. Um, so, but again, th these are these are things that would be considered normal in certain circumstances based upon the environment as much as based upon the individual. Okay, next slide, please. Um, by the way, telling somebody that's wandering or that's in the wrong room that isn't their room if they have cognitive impairment, they may not be able to comprehend that it's not their room. They may think the whole building is their house and that they're in their bedroom. So trying to reorient them or tell them that they're wrong often is extremely ineffective. Okay, Once in a great while, you can maybe redirect people or steer them back to where they belong, uh, but trying to reorient them uh, really is, is an exercise in frustration and often makes things worse. Um, I've, I want to talk to you a little bit about fragmented care just to emphasize that very often what happens is people have multiple practitioners for different parts of their body, maybe a heart specialist, a, a urologist, a endocrinologist, and what one person does may, especially in the way of prescribing medicines, may cause problems for other parts of the body, but since they just focus on one thing, they don't typically concern themselves with the, those other consequences, and that can lead to uh, other problems, which I'll point out. The other thing is that, in, and I alluded to this earlier, but for a single episode of illness, care is, infrequent, is frequently fragmented across multiple settings. Next, next slide, please. Um, and I won't, I, I, I'm just going to tell you this case, which you can read about, is just an illustration of a man who had Alzheimer's who saw a urologist who put him on a medicine who made him confused. Uh, he went to the hospital. They mistook his confusion for a urinary tract infection and put him on another medicine which made him more confused, and so on and so forth. And ultimately, the side effect of those medicines caused it, him to not be able to urinate, and he ended up back at the urologist. So it was just a vicious circle that continued. Next slide, please. And that just illustrates care fragmented across the body and across different settings. And I think I've already talked about the healthcare culture, but uh, in healthcare, there's this belief that the, that the best days are in the past, and we just have to hang on. And that isn't, there, there often is an element of fear and a, a goal of trying to do things the same way all the time. Now, that's part of the culture, but I have to tell you that there's never been a better time in the history of the world to be a doctor or a nurse or a caregiver. Uh, and there's never been a better time in the history of the world to be a son or a daughter of anybody that needs care because there's never been a greater need. So the amount of good that you can do 
has never been matched in the history of the world. So I, I, there are some unhealthy aspects of the healthcare culture that need to change and that hopefully we can change, uh, but I, I make a distinction between the job or the workplace and the work itself. So the work is critically important. There's nothing more, nothing more important in life than you can do than love and care for another human being. Uh, but unfortunately, the workplaces, the physical structures, the, the, the way that work is organized often gets in the way of our mission and achieving that. So I won't belabor that any further. We'll go to the next slide. Um, I think I'm going to skip over this. The, the point of this slide was just to say that uh, when people often, when people don't go along with, with, if they're not compliant, as the word is, in healthcare, they're often kind of blamed for that. In this particular case, someone was discharged against medical advice. The, and I've seen this happen many, many times. The irony is that only people who have decision-making capacity are, are legally allowed to, dis, to discharge themselves against medical advice. And this is a failure of the uh, doctor in this case to uh, to identify and assess that because this is somebody who was had dementia and because they had dementia they couldn't comprehend what was going on. People were sticking sharp needles in his arm to draw thought that they were attacking him and he became quote belligerent and resisted care. But if anybody were to stick sharp needles in your arm while you were sleeping you would respond in the same exact way because it's almost like a reflex. It's it's how we're made as animals to survive. So next slide, please. Uh, and part of what I'm trying to tell you is that all the behaviors that you might encounter with people with dementia that are considered problematic are in, in large part reactive to the environment, particularly the people in the environment. They're not planned out ahead of time. And in many ways, they're kind of predictable. Uh, Okay, I want to spend a minute talking about care delivery and staffing and point out a couple of things. The first of which is that there's been a major shift in healthcare delivery over the last 20 or 30 years to, uh, in how people think about staffing and how they figure out how many people uh, they want to employ in, a, in an individual setting. And basically, it boils down to this. The way that staffing is calculated now is based on task performance and how long it takes to perform individual tasks like passing meds, uh, bathing, uh, feeding, and things like that. And so any care setting, whether it's assisted living, uh, a nursing home, a hospital, or other, other things, will calculate a per patient per day staffing uh, ratio that's, that's the result of adding up eight minutes for this task and 12 for that task and so forth. And so, and the thing about that is, is that they're not providing staffing in order to continuously supervise or continuously engage individual people. And uh, when you think about, for example, a daycare center, um, a daycare center, there's going to be somebody who's supervising the children all the time, regardless of what additional tasks need to be performed. And in healthcare settings, that is far from the case. Even in the intensive care unit, most of the time when somebody enters a patient's room, it's to perform a task, and any monitoring they do, they do remotely looking at a screen, mainly looking at squiggly lines and numbers and stuff like that. Uh, the other thing that I'll point out is that the, uh, the, uh, even though no healthcare setting wants to say uh, what the right you know, what, what nobody wants to agree to a minimum staffing level, they all unofficially have a maximum staffing level. And the proof of that is that um, if, the, if the number of patients falls below a certain level on a unit or a wing in a hospital or nursing home, it's not unusual, it's typical in a hospital, that people will be told to go home. And I have a, a case that I'll just allude to. It's the next slide, please. Um, uh, Lori, if you wouldn't mind hitting the next one. And basically, I did, this is just an example of a, a very an excellent employee who's a nurse who has to spend money. On, she has to spend money on gas, and she has to spend money on childcare, and she's loyal and dedicated. And the the reward for that is at various times when she shows up to work, if there's not not enough work to be done, uh, she's sent home without pay or is told to take a vacation day, even though. This is not how she would prefer to spend her vacation. And ironically, uh, 
there are lots of added costs to this because this contributes to turnover uh, and replacing people is hideously expensive. So this is a widespread industry practice uh, that, uh, that inadvertently tends to punish the most loyal, dedicated employees. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and we, uh, uh, in terms of education and training, I just point out that what you see repeated is what people are taught. They're taught to uh, do things a, a certain way, but there's really minimal, if any, training uh, among physicians and nurses on geriatrics per se. And unless you're an LPN, you probably got very little on-site training in a nursing home. Uh, LPNs tend to get more of their training in nursing homes and siting, sites outside the hospital. RNs tend to get more of their training in hospital settings. And physician training is mostly in the hospital because in the past that's where the patients all were. So um, I'm just trying to point out that you know, part, when we see the same things repeated, the system, if you want to call it that way, has produced that result reliably and it will continue to happen unless we change the systems and processes that produce that. Next slide, please. Uh, and I'm going to skip over this. I just this is a slide that you can read about. But basically, um, people who are trained in one setting don't underst always understand what happens in other settings, and they make assumptions about people's intentions. In this case, you have an angry physician because other people weren't willing to do what he what he wanted. But I I'll refer you to an aphorism referred to as. Hanlon's razor, okay, and and Hanlon's razor is essentially this: never attribute to malice what could be more easily explained by stupidity. Okay, next slide, please. Um, and uh, I, I'm going to kind of gloss over a lot of stuff just to talk, just to say that communication between settings is limited, and sharing of information is limited, and this can create a lot of problems. Like, for example, figuring out what medicines people are actually supposed to take especially since in healthcare settings the med medications are frequently added and less frequently stopped so that the medicines you take when you leave the hospital are different than the medicines you took when you entered the hospital and nursing home and vice versa. Next slide, please. So uh, I want to I want a moment here uh, and I want to ask you to, if you wouldn't mind to uh, type in any questions you have so far or to get back to the original question, question I posed to you, what what do you want or need to get out of this session to make it worthwhile for you? And I'm just going to pause here for a moment while you type, and we'll respond to those. So as a reminder, you can type into the chat box in the bottom um, right corner of your screen in the in the dashboard um, from the webinar um, and a, a question or um, a thought about um, what particularly you'd like to hear um, about it bef as before Dr. Evans moves forward. So any thoughts? And I might remind you that it's completely anonymous. We don't know who you are, so you can you can troll me all you want. Mm -hmm. And certainly, um, Jonathan. It, as folks are, um, as we're waiting for one or two things to come in, um, you know, you had mentioned um, how folks have um, automatic reactions to some situations, um, and they might have been a similar reaction whether or not the person had dementia. For example, the exactly. person who was getting the blood taken, um, you know, at four o'clock in the morning, I probably would have reacted the same way. So. Um, you know, I think thinking through for the audience um, maybe what alternatives or how to make that a, a more palliative, palliative uh, more um, a better situation for um, the individual um, cause so at receiving, you know, getting the blood drawn, but, you know, it's probably also not a good experience for the staff person, you know, who is having to deal with um, someone who is, you know, facing the, sure. uh, the challenges. Uh, absolutely, and I'm glad you mentioned that. Let me just respond to that for a moment. Um, first of all, as you can imagine, hospitals and nursing homes, they have sort of their own routines, and they don't always match our routines as human beings outside of those settings. Uh, and 
some of what happens, frankly, at a minimum, we would we would say is at least impolite. Waking somebody up from a sound sleep that's sick, you know, that's not something that that's not nice, but it happens all the time. And I guess the and the reason it happens is because they want to get those results as quickly as possible for the convenience of the physician who ordered the test. And so that points out that you know these healthcare environments weren't really created with the primary focus being the person who lives there, or even if they live there just for one or a few nights in the hospital, they're created for the convenience of the people that work there. And I can tell you as a physician, there's no place that's more efficient for physician practice than a hospital. And there's probably no place that's less efficient than a nursing home, but that's because it was created for the efficiency of other people, particularly nursing staff. But uh, to, to Lori's point, um, a lot of what happens in the name, I mean, we. As healthcare providers, we generally speaking, we rely on other people, the patients, to help us help them. And the problem, if you have dementia, number one, is that um, if you can't comprehend what people are trying to do, you can't really help them help you because you don't. Their intention may seem very different. And I'll give you an example of that. Again, uh, and a lot of the things that that are that are considered to be resisting care are really people feeling threatened. And there's been many a, a, a person, a cognitively normal person who's bitten their dentist's finger, for example, because somebody stuck, stuck their finger in, in their mouth or something like that. Um, if you were to take a hairbrush and try to comb somebody else's hair, particularly somebody that doesn't see very well, they might see you standing over them or, you know, with a an object in your hand that could look kind of like a club or something like that. And so that could be a very threatening thing. If you were to try to stick something in somebody's mouth, whether it was a spoon or a toothbrush, they may have a hard time comprehending that and the natural, almost reflexive reaction would be to sort of resist. But if on the other hand you take the hair hairbrush or the toothbrush and you put it in their hand and you hold their hand and you kind of demonstrate for them what to do with it, like brushing your their hair with them or brushing their teeth with them, then it's a familiar thing that they'll continue on their own. And so that, those are just, that's just a, a very simple example of uh, how we can modify our approach in caregiving to help people. And the other thing I would point out about that is that it, um, what we're doing is we're working with people's abilities. We're, we're letting them do what they're still able to do instead of focusing on what they can't do. Okay, so uh, uh, nobody had any spe other specific questions for me. I guess I'll just be the one asking questions. But uh, um, and the first, and again, the question was, what does good dementia care look like? Why don't we scroll ahead, and I'll try to define this a little in a little more detail. Um, the um, I what I'm about to talk about really are principles of good care for anybody. That's why I put the word dementia in parentheses here. But uh, good care is focuses on the individual person and is centered around them, uh, not around the convenience of the provider and so forth. And I mean, the, you can understand for economic reasons why it's far more efficient to have certain things where many pe people can be seen uh, quickly and so forth uh, that can improve access to care. But for certain individuals in certain circumstances, that can make it harder for them to get what they need if they can't get there, can't wait, and so forth. And if you've ever waited for, I mean, I'm embarrassed to say that patients of mine over the years have often waited a long time for me, particularly in the office, because I like to spend a lot of time with patients, and I would often get behind. But the, the notion that somehow people should wait for me because I'm more important to, than they are is as offensive to me as it ought to be for them. And so as you, as you start evaluating care in any setting, how, whether people are waiting around for things to happen is an indicator of whether the, whether the care is really focused on them or on, the, uh, on other people or the environment. Uh, good care should help you do as much as you can or as much as you want to do for yourself, should help you not just, should help you feel better and do more. And there are many things within healthcare like lowering people's cholesterol that doesn't actually help them feel better at all. It may actually help them make them feel worse because of side effects. But it's an act of faith that if you do this, it may have positive consequences down the road. When we're talking about geriatrics and about people with dementia, 
for the most part, we don't want them to make a long-term investment like that, that if they feel bad for a while, that it'll be better down the road. Uh, good care also involves enduring relationships. Uh, that also means consistent caregivers. And for someone with dementia, that's especially important because uh, it's familiar and it makes it, it's comforting and it makes everything easier. Uh, as pe in geriatrics, we take pride in stopping more medicines than we start. And in, with regard to dementia care, uh, and, and really any care, we want to try to minimize the use of medicines because medicines, while they may be very, very beneficial, they have other consequences. They may be very expensive. Medications interact with one another. And so adding another medicine down the road for a good purpose may cause problems. And, uh, and most medicines are not intended to be used for life. Uh, the other thing is that when we prescribe medicines, it should be based on the right sizing the medicine for the size of the person and their kidney function, and really focusing on understanding the, the individual person. And when I say that, what I mean is you should get the care that you want and need. Uh, but how do you know what, if, if what you want and need? Other people may have an obligation to help you by giving you information to, to educate you and empower you. That's the, that's the concept of this idea of informed consent. Uh, and in order for me to give you the best uh, uh, recommendations for care, I need to understand you as well as possible. I need your body and your conditions and so forth. But I, under, I need to understand how you live, how you want to live, and uh, what kind of help you want or might need. Um, the word care itself, in any other setting, would be almost synonymous with the word love. So good care is, is acts of love uh, performed for the benefit of another person. Of another person. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and when we talk about person-centered care, we're shifting the focus and attention onto the person and their goals and wishes. And, and another way of saying that is we're shifting the balance of power from the doctor, let's say, to the patient. Uh, instead of it being doctor knows best, it's, it should be the patient knows best what's right for them based on the information that they've been providing, the education and guidance. Uh, Person-centered care is all about choices. And as we talk about nursing home care and hospital care specifically, we'll talk about some of those choices and whether you can tell people are getting choices. And even though people may lose the ability to make decisions about complicated things, uh, there, as long as it's a safe choice, like between wearing this item of clothing or that item of clothing, uh, they should still be entitled to the choice because that may give them some more uh, pleasure or joy or even uh, symbolically help them feel like they have more control. Um, Person-centered care, particularly in a residential setting, means that you should sleep when you want to sleep, eat when you want to eat be engaged in meaningful activities that are of interest to you. The place where you live should be comfortable and should look like a place where you would want to live. Uh, and person-centered care respects you as a human being regardless of whatever choices you make in life. So it doesn't blame you for being sick or for ha being a smoker or something like that. It do you don't get fired because you don't do what somebody else says or, or whatever. Uh, and as I talked about before, uh, in the person-centered healthcare setting, there wouldn't be a lot of waiting, uh, if at all. Next slide, please. Um, as as we, I alluded to some of this, but people with dementia may have a hard time comprehending or communicating choices and goals and preferences. We often have to rely on other people uh, to help us to understand the person better or to speak on their behalf. Uh, but the more we know about a person uh, and their life, the more we can perhaps anticipate what choices they might like in a particular setting. Um, the other thing about person-centered care that's really critical is, is the idea of engaging with other human beings to the extent that people want to. Not everybody's, I mean, there are at least as many introverts as there are extroverts. Not everybody who lives in a congregate environment like a nursing home or assisted living is used to being around a lot of other people, and some of them may find it overstimulating or just annoying. Um, but we want it, to, it should ideally match what people, what people want and what, what's familiar and comfortable for them. 
there should be meaningful activities. As human beings, we're engaged in doing things that we enjoy. The, the important thing is things that we enjoy and that we're able to do. And with a condition like dementia, uh, people's abilities change over time. Um, we obviously, as I mentioned before, we want to focus on people what, on what people can do and help them to be successful at doing that rather than what they can't do and doing everything for them. And we need to modify the plan and how we care for people as their condition changes over time. Let me give you an example of uh, music. And, and it's, it's common, uh, even in hospitals, you might see somebody playing the piano in the lobby or something like that. But it's, it certainly is common in nursing homes or assisted living facilities and daycare program, adult day programs, I don't like to call them daycare, to have so, some kind of musical performance or music being played. And it might take the form of a sing-along or something like that. And people with early dementia may be able to remember the tune, even if they don't remember the words. They may remember the words well and may be able to sing just fine, so forth. But, um, but over time, as, as their brain function changes, their ability to engage in that might be different. Somebody who a year ago was actually dancing to the beat or bingo is something that requires a certain amount of attention and cognition and even among those of us on the call, some of us would really enjoy bingo and some of us would not. So, you know, the idea that one activity fits all just doesn't really make any sense. You know, and if you went on a cruise ship and they offered bingo, some of you, if that was the only activity that they had, you would be unhappy, as you should be, unless you really love bingo and went on a bingo cruise. Okay. Um, I just wanted to, I, I, I listed here a comparison to child care or preschool or school. By that I mean that those are different settings where uh, the activities are geared toward abilities, uh, and the focus is on engaging people pretty much all day long. Uh, uh, and even though in a child care setting, individual children may need a lot of help with activities of daily living, the focus isn't just on feeding and watering people and making sure they're dry and changing their diapers. So that's, that's just simply that simply would not be good enough, and I'm using these as examples just to point out, you know, to compare and contrast how things are in different settings and how those might be incorporated in a healthcare setting as well. Um, by the way, uh, since I was mentioning childcare, let me give you a scenario. Supposing that you had a child or a grandchild in in a daycare setting, and you came, you went to pick them up this evening. And the the sort of the leader of the the center told you, well, he had a pretty rough morning, but we gave him some medicine, and he's doing fine. He slept all day, and actually, when you pick him up, he's been incontinent of urine. It looks like he's drooling, and he's kind of lethargic. Are you with me on that? How does that make you feel? You know, that's a scenario where you're responsible for the welfare of another human being. Somebody has done something to them without your knowledge or consent. And most of the time that would make people be very upset. I mean, you, you might call the police or child protective services before you even left the parking lot if you did leave before they showed up. Uh, and I point that out because that, what I just described to you is, is the issue underlying dementia cares, very often people are prescribed medicines without their family's knowledge. Uh, and if you have a, a, a responsibility as a surrogate decision maker, you, you have a responsibility to make sure that things don't happen to you without your knowledge and consent. But this, this kind of stuff can happen all the time. I use that case as an example when I'm talking to doctors and nurses about why some people, myself included, get very, very upset when older people are given sedating medicines and other things without, without being informed about the risks and alternatives and so forth. And I also want to point out to doctors that when we talk about using these kinds of drugs in healthcare settings, 
number one, we're not treating disease because these, these diseases weren't meant for that and they don't make the problems go away. Number two, it's a moral issue. It's not just a medical issue. Um, so uh, let's hit the next slide, please. Um, here's a, uh, we'll, 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 let's think about this from a patient-centered perspective. Here's a woman with dementia who has arthritis of her knees and hips. And it's not unusual when people have pain in their joints that they feel, especially what's called osteoarthritis, is that when they sit around for a while, they get stiffer and things hurt more. And I, I'm, I experience this myself when I have been exercising or something or just, and then, or walking, and then I end up being in a car for a long time. When I first start to move, I feel pretty stiff and uncomfortable. But the more I move, the better it gets. So um, here's an example where the wandering and agitation could easily be caused by pain. But as you look at the patient's record, you see they have, an, uh, they have a prescription for a pain medicine. It's actually a narcotic pain medicine. It's hydrocodone and Tylenol. That's the 5 and the 325. And it's given uh, as needed or per re nata, PRN, which is, means as the situation requires. Um, well, the patient can't ask for it. So she really doesn't have any uh, control over that. And if she's truly having predictable pain on a regular basis, we probably would be better off giving her some kind of scheduled pain medicine, probably something like Tylenol on a regular basis, to see if we could prevent the problem and use a less uh, a medicine with fewer side effects. The other thing that you have to wonder about in a situation like this, and as a medical director we run into this from time to time, if the only time she ever gets it is on the night shift, when presumably she's more likely to be sleeping and only one nurse gives it, then you also have to wonder, is the patient actually getting the medicine or is it being diverted? Uh, next slide, please. I just try to combine as many things in one slide to make you angry as possible. So that was only two lines, but I'm sure I got you riled up and I, I apologize. Um, so in terms of how you evaluate the care as to whether it's person-centered or not, if you're walking to a care facility, maybe it's where you work, ask, you know, observe and ask, ask yourself, ask the other folks there, do people have choices? Do they have choices, for example, about uh, when they eat, uh, uh, when they go to bed, and when they wake up? Uh, is the care personalized based on their life, their stated goals, their needs and preferences? And again, uh, if somebody, for example, has a hit, uh, well, the activities that they engage in hopefully would relate in some way to their life and their experiences and be a continuation of their life before they ended up with dementia or before they ended up in another care setting. What's familiar is often of great comfort, okay? Um, the other thing is watch to see if people have to wait for other people to help them. If you have to wait for people to help you get to the bathroom, you may not, you're more likely not to make it on time. And so one of the ways we would measure that in terms of good care is how frequently people experience incontinence. Uh, if you have to wait for other people to feed you, uh, that and you don't and that doesn't happen that could result in weight loss that's another thing that we can measure uh, how, do people appear to be comfortable are they in pain do they have to wait for pain relief do they have to wait for help getting dressed and you can evaluate that based on looking around to see if people are in bed if they're out of bed if they're dressed or if they're in some kind of pajamas or, or hospital gowns or things like that um, and a hospital gown, needs to say, is not patient-centered or person-centered, okay? Uh, the, the purpose of a hospital gown is not to benefit the patient at all. It's to make it easier for other people to undress you in the name of uh, providing care. So nobody would say, I love this hospital gown so much, I'm going to wear it home, okay? Um, so um, there's certain things that if you saw would probably give you an idea that care is not really person-centered. If you see people lined up in wheelchairs around a nursing station or around a dining room with the doors closed, that tells you that people don't have a lot of choices, that someone has put them there either for their convenience or they're waiting. You know, it may be that they think the food is great and they can't wait to eat it, but they don't have any choice about when they eat. Another thing I would point out about dementia is even though as people get older, and this is magnified when people develop dementia, sleep 
sleep and wake cycles often become fragmented. People tend not to sleep the whole night through and might nap periodically. The, the thing about dementia is if you have dementia, when you're awake, you're going to be awake. So if you're in a care setting and you see people who never seem to be fully awake, they seem, for lack of a better term, dopey, uh, that's probably the side effect of medications. And that's not, uh, I mean, if somebody wasn't answering your questions or, or doing anything that you thought was unusual, if you just saw somebody sitting there, you shouldn't be able to tell whether they have dementia or not just by looking at them uh, because they should look quite normal. And if, if people look sick or, or uh, lethargic, that's not dementia, but it might be a side effect of their treatment, uh, which is a, not a desirable or, in my mind, acceptable side effect. Okay, uh, next slide, please. Caregivers encounter and they can be extremely frustrating. It's one of the biggest things that leads to caregiver stress and even caregiver burnout is behavior that makes it hard to take care of somebody or hard to feel like they're being safe. But I just want to emphasize that behavior is not a disease. Behavior is really communication. And in people who've lost the ability to communicate with words, behavior is often the preferred or the only way to communicate. And if you've ever been in a country where you don't speak the language, and you've tried to communicate, you've done so through behavior. I might also add that most of us are more tuned in to other people's nonverbal communication. And if, ever, if you're ever talking to somebody and their body language is saying one thing and their words are saying something else, you're going to be inclined to trust your impression of their body language more than the words. So all of us on the call right now, we rely on uh, nonverbal communication actually more than we rely on words. My admonition to you when trying to communicate with somebody who has dementia is trying to figure out what they're trying to say without words. And because of the disease causing people to have a, a smaller vocabulary, the words become less precise and they don't always mean the same person's, same thing to, from the person speaking the word as it does to the person hearing the word. So. Uh, if, for example, somebody is yelling repeatedly, help, 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 it could mean that they're bored. It could mean that they mean, need some specific help. But if you ask them, can I help you, they may very well not know how to respond to that and wondering why you're either, either, even asking, but they will often stop saying it. And, you know, again, that may just be something repetitive that, because people are bored. Next slide, please. Uh, somebody who's wandering, the question, you know, what, what does... What does that behavior tell you? Well, it could tell you that they, they're looking for something uh, or they're trying to get away from something. That Maybe they need to go to the bathroom. Maybe they're tired. Maybe it was noisy where they were and they were looking for something else. Maybe they're curious. I, I tend to, uh, I guess you could say I'm a wanderer. I, I like to move around and walk and I don't like to sit still for very long. Um, agitation. Uh, Generally speaking, the basic message there is distress. The question is, what are they distressed about? And if if and this is a behavior that's often reactive. That people are they weren't agitated until we tried to do something for them or to them or uh, ask them to do something that they don't comprehend, and they misinterpret it as a threat to them and it bothers them. Uh, and if I kept telling you, if you thought it was 1973 right now. You know it's 2016, it's 2016, it's 2016. After a while, that would upset you. By the way, agitation is kind of a, it's, it's somewhat pejorative, but if you're not in healthcare, that word is generally not part of your vocabulary. Other people outside of healthcare, instead of saying, you would never describe yourself as agitated, you would describe how you feel. Okay, so if you're ever confronted by a situation where somebody is said to be agitated or that word pops in your head, ask yourself, what must that person be feeling right now and why? Resisting care, as we talked about, is often and primarily due to a misunderstanding or the fact that, and, I, I, um, and again, all these behaviors are things that you would see in a toddler. You know, my son, for example, is 16. Uh, very often he was very, he had, he'd have a full diaper, but he wasn't bothered by it. But if I took it off, he suddenly became cold that was bothersome. So he would often resist me changing his diaper because 
I wasn't helping him. I was interfering with whatever uh, private reverie he was in at that moment. Uh, again, I just want to emphasize that so-called bad behaviors, and I, and I put that in parentheses, they're reactive. People aren't planning these in, in advance. They're, people are just responding almost like a reflex, and they typically represent a conflict or and a misunderstanding between that individual and the other people around them. Uh, but labeling behaviors as bad or people as bad becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy because people alter their own, uh, you know, people become defensive and that the more defensive we are, the more offensive it is to other people. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this is a woman that I, I'm taking care of right now and she was, she, uh, basically she had, she ended up in a nursing facility for a few months, was started on lots of medicines because of agitation. And eventually, and, and not only did things not get better, but it seemed like the more they did, the worse things got. Eventually, they got, a, they, uh, they got an order from the magistrate to have her sent to the hospital under what's called a temporary det det detaining order, detention order. So she was involuntarily kept in the hospital for several days um, against her will. Um, and the facility that sent her wouldn't take her back because they said they took, couldn't take care of her and they sent her to a facility where I became her doctor. And uh, she was on, well, basically, before I even met her or knew anything about her, all, I was told that she has Alzheimer's and they gave me the list of her medicines, at least one of which was an antipsychotic drug. And so I told the nurse that called me that I was not going to prescribe that medicine uh, unless or until I had a good reason for it and that I would see her the next day to uh, figure that out. Her Son was very upset about that and uh, and called me and said he didn't want me to stop it until I had seen the patient. So we kind of compromised. I told him what my concerns were. Um, and when I met her, she basically told me that people have been watching. Well, the staff said she's paranoid and has dementia. She actually had not been diagnosed with dementia before she went to the nursing, the first nursing home. But anyway, to make a long story short. She was saying, I, they're poisoning me and they're watching me on, 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 there's cameras watching me, okay? That sounds kind of paranoid, doesn't it? What if I told you that they were poisoning her and there were cameras watching her? Because that was actually much closer to the truth and certainly in her mind it was the absolute truth. And what do I mean by that? In the hospital, she was in a room where they had cameras that, were, that she could see that were in fact watching her and every now and then people would come in the room and, ref and say, I saw you do that. In addition to that, she was giving medicines. All of her medicines were being crushed up and put in her food. So whenever she ate anything, it tasted like poison. So um, she was sort of labeled as having paranoia, which was a justification for certain medicines, when in fact, her reaction is the exact same reaction that you or I would have if we could tell that something was being put in our food that tasted awful and if we if in fact people were watching us so that's a very big bizarre thing and that's not let's just say that's not a home like environment um, I had to basically reassure the son and the daughter that over my dead body would she be kicked out of this nursing home uh, before they were willing to let me stop some of these other medicines because they were so worried that her mother would misbehave and she would be sent back to the hospital and and uh, involuntarily committed Next slide, please. Uh, so uh, how can you, t I know we've talked about some examples of care that's not so good. I just, uh, this is a little bit of a summary, but how can you tell if care is good? Well, you can observe the care, which we talked about. That's not possible that often if, you, if you're working or if you are trying to oversee a loved one's care from a great distance like another state. But if you happen to be able to observe care, uh, first of all, the most important thing probably is to look at the people around you, the people providing the care and the people receiving the care, and ask yourself, do they seem to be happy? Uh, are they smiling? Are they engaged with one another? Is, does this seem like a place where the people that work there are glad they work there? Does it seem like a place where the people that live there are, seem comfortable living there? Is this a place where people are actually living or are they just existing? And now I, I realize there's so many biases against uh, older people in this country and, and the idea of living in a nursing home. I mean, even the vast majority of older people say they would rather die than live in a nursing home. But that's, 
probably more a reflection of the fact that people would rather, older people say they'd rather die than be totally dependent on other people and lose their faculties. So we have to be try to be objective about this, but in an objective sense, as a consumer, even if you work there, ask yourself, is this a place where you'd want your mom to be, or where you would you be comfortable living if you needed that kind of a care? Uh, the other thing I would ask you, this doesn't happen all the time, but this has been a great lesson for me, is that I think I know a person, a, a patient of mine, and then something happens like a child shows up, or a dog, or a cat, uh, you know, pet therapy, or the music comes on, and I see people coming to life, okay, and they often are functioning at a level higher than what I had expected, and that causes me to think that I've underestimated them, and that frankly, there's more that they that 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 I can offer them. Uh, the other thing that I would do um, is, if you are looking for a place for care, or if you have is ask the people providing the care, um, kind of what their philosophy is about dementia and dementia care, what the word dementia means to them, and how they kind of approach that, um, and the reason I say that is because this is really, uh, even though there's problems with specialization, not everybody's really cut out to provide dementia care. Not everybody's cut out to be a parent. Not everybody's cut out to be a spouse. You know, uh, I mean, we all have our strengths and weaknesses, and there are people who really are fulfilled by providing dementia care, and there are other people who are required to do it because of staffing issues, but it's not something they were really trained to do or feel comfortable doing. And some one times you can sometimes you can tell that or tell that they're stressed out when you ask about a behavior that is shall we say undesirable, uh, like hollering out or something. If somebody says they're constantly doing that, that's an indicator that this this isn't their f cup of tea or that they're they've kind of reached their limit because there's really no behavior that's truly constant. And in order for us to figure out what it is, we have to figure out what brings it on, you know, what contributes to it, uh, what makes it better, who's around, and so forth, what they might be interpreting. Um, I know we're about running out of time, so let me just talk about, uh, in every care setting, even in hospitals, there are different quality measures that you can look at from a distance. They're available online if you go to the CMS website, and uh, you, there'll be a site for nursing home compare and hospital care. The thing I would just point, and I alluded to some of these, me how you can measure that, for example, how often people lose function, how often people become incontinent, how often people have catheters, how often people lose weight. Those are indicators of poor care, but uh, but those are some of the ways that we can monitor what's happening in facilities. I would just point out those quality measures don't, they're not the same quality measures in hospitals. The use of antipsychotic drugs in dementia is a negative quality indicator in nursing homes that's reported on the internet, but it's not reported in hospitals or in other care settings. And so you can use the CMS website, but I also want to refer you to consumer voice resources, uh, some of which are extremely robust. And if you're, a, let me just say, if you're a care provider, that just as an example, and I, I, I don't want to make too fine a point of this, but cons of all the different organizations involved in healthcare, the one that came up with the very best uh, analysis of the new regulations coming out for nursing homes was Consumer Voice. And pretty much every other healthcare organization, including the industry that of nursing home owners and operators, used Consumer Voice's uh, materials in order to figure out what was going on. So this is really top quality education. And within the Consumer Voice, I would point your attention to the uh, National Ombudsman's Re, I'm not saying this right, National Ombudsman Resource Center or NORC. There's lots of additional material there. So that could really, these are free materials, but so pardon the expression when I say it's one-stop shopping. I think if you Google consumer voice or if you Google uh, nursing home or hospital compare, you'll get a lot of the information that you might find helpful. Next slide, please. Um, so how can you make it make care better? And, and this applies to you if you work in healthcare or uh, if you don't. Uh, either way, it's, it's still the same thing, and that is the most important thing you can do is to be present, and and your presence makes a difference. Uh, your presence humanizes the other people around you, and how you interact with them is is sets the example for how other people are treated and should be treated. Uh, as a caregiver, you and this is much easier if you're a family caregiver, but the goal is to know the patient as a person. 
to know their life and their family, and, and that helps you to understand what they're trying to tell you without words. Uh, you can make care better by leading, by, by, by being you, and by, by uh, leading the example of your own life. Uh, by by demonstrating love and kindness and patience and listening. Uh, you can teach and support and praise other people, like my friend who was try, trying to offer help to the facility. Uh, they didn't take all of his help, but one of the things that he did is he knew all the names of the staff, including the CNAs and the housekeepers. He called them by name. He thanked them for the, the positive things that they did, and he tried to replicate success by pointing it out. Uh, so, you know, uh, if you see something that's done wrong, certainly point it out along, not just with the fact that it's done wrong, but what your expectations are for what should be done instead. If you see something done right, whether it's by a colleague or by a paid caregiver, uh, point that out and they'll be more likely to repeat that. And uh, just continue to communicate the love and the caring that, that all of you uh, have in abundance. Uh, next slide, please. So I, I know I talked a lot, and, and I'm available to answer any of your questions. Hopefully you have some now or some comments. But I'll just summarize and give you a few of my conclusions by saying that there are, as I pointed out earlier, there are many challenges and barriers to uh, good care for anybody, for anything. There are even more challenges for people with dementia because they can't often advocate for themselves and communicate their needs. Overcoming these challenges requires the involvement of people across care settings. If you're a family member, it basically means trying to be present as much as possible, whether it's in the hospital or, the, or a, an office clinic or a nursing home, whenever possible when care decisions are being contemplated and, and b being involved uh, so that you can advocate for people who can't but because of their illness advocate for themselves. I, I would just point out that all of us can imagine good care, the care that we would want uh, and I just want you to keep that image in mind because if, if, you, can't, if you can imagine it, you can achieve it. Uh, but unfortunately, it is easier sometimes to imagine things than it is to receive that kind of care. Uh, but I also would point out from some of the cases and examples I gave you that the, the, regardless of whether we're professional health care providers or not, the status quo is not an option for you, for me for your mom or for anyone, and all of us need to commit to trying to continue to make life better. Uh, regardless of our roles or responsibilities today, if we're really honest with ourselves, what we do now is preparing a place for ourselves tomorrow. We are creating the care that we're going to receive as well. And a big, a big challenge and an, uh, my admonition to you is to help others to see what's possible and encourage them to, to make it possible. So I think that's that's all I had to say, but I appreciate uh, your patience and indulgence with me. Uh, if you've hung on this long, you're an incredibly patient person, and I thank you for that. And regardless of your career or your role, I know that you would be uh, a, a wonderful person to love and care for others. So you have within you everything you need. Um, and there are other people like you, and we can all stick together and try to help one another make things better. So thank you very much. I'll, I'll uh, stay on for any questions or uh, comments that you have. And again, I, I, I'll go back to my original question is, what were you hoping for with this presentation? Even though we spent an hour, I assure you it's not too late. I'm happy to try to remediate and make it right. If there's something that you didn't get or needed or it wasn't clear, we'll fix it right now. So thank you. Thank you very much, Jonathan. And um, again, uh, if there are any questions, just type them into the chat or question box, and we'll be happy to read them off to Dr. Evans. Um, and if not today, but if something comes up um, you know, afterwards, you can send it to us, and uh, we'll try to get an answer to you um, from him as well. But um, thank you so much for a really terrific presentation. Uh, so many great things to think about and, and strategies to be um, thinking about and, and thinking about how we implement them um, to really think about, you know, 
how we know the person, and, and that's really um, what it boils down to in terms of providing the good care um, and in, in addressing some of the issues that may arise when a person is not able to verbally communicate with you. And, and I, it really struck home for me when you were talking earlier about um, you know, when a person is beginning to lose their vocabulary, some of the words they say may not necessarily mean what you think they're meaning. Um, and, you know, the example that you gave of the person saying help, help, help uh, over again just brought me back to, you know, recent visits that I've had to um, a nursing home to visit family members when I, you know, we would ask certain questions and, and the responses might be different than we would have expected um, because they were losing their words. Um, and, and so we had to like think through again what, what were they meaning when they were responding to questions or what is it that they wanted. Um, and so it's important to really think about the, the you know, the person and, and what it is that they're trying to tell you. Well, I appreciate that insight. I, I I can only say for myself that there's so many times in life where I wish I'd said something differently, where or I may have misunderstood other people's words, um, and the words often get in the way of what we're trying, what we're really trying to communicate. So, um, huh. uh, good for us. It's not the only way to communicate. Absolutely, and and I guess uh, you know we're not seeing any questions come in, but I, I think you know the summary and conclusions that you listed on this last slide are are really important takeaways for folks. And I guess I would also say one of the you know important takeaways that I heard um, from your presentation in terms of thinking about the behavior and what what that is what that person's trying to communicate to us with that behavior and um, and just not taking it at face value that they're trying to be disruptive but that they're trying to tell you something um, and that you need to dig a little bit deeper and find out what it is that that behavior is trying to tell you um, and really looking even deeper again and what brings it on what alleviates um, some of the some of the behaviors that that you're um, because that will really get at what that person's needs are um, and, and that it's important um, to find other ways to communicate with that person with dementia when they when they can't communicate back to you with words. Well, thank you for that. And again, I appreciate everybody being on the call. Um, obviously, you prefer to let your actions speak more than your words since there weren't any questions or comments, but um, uh, I just want to encourage you in the work that you're doing and let you know that I'm uh, I'm happy to try to help you in my own small way in any way that I can. Well, thanks so much, Jonathan. Thank you um, to all of you for joining us this afternoon. Um, as we mentioned at the top of the program, um, this was recorded, and we'll be sending a, a copy of the recording to you all. Um, the slides will be included with that as well. And if you do have questions. Um, send them to us at the Consumer Voice, and we'll try and get you the information um, that you need. So with that, we'll close for your time today. Thank you all. Everyone. Thank you, Lori.